Language is a communication system employing arbitrary symbols. These symbols, normally words, have to be stored. The following different types of word store exist. On the one hand, we have dictionaries. On the other, we have lexicons. Well, both types of word stores will be addressed in the following. Let's start with dictionaries. Now, word stores that are primarily consulted for the reason of retrieving information about the words of a language are referred to as dictionaries. Today, we have two types of variants of dictionaries. We have book dictionaries over here, the classical form of a dictionary, and we have machine-readable dictionaries, dictionaries which are delivered either on external disks such as CD-ROM, DVD, or more commonly today on the web. The most common types of book dictionary are encyclopedic monolingual dictionaries, bilingual dictionaries, or dictionaries for special purposes such as dictionaries that represent synonyms. Machine-readable dictionaries are similar concerning their content. However, as I said, they are delivered uh, externally on specific storage devices such as CD-ROMs or in the cloud of the World Wide Web. Dictionaries do not play any role within the theory of grammar. Rather, they are independent word stores used to obtain information about the words of a language. Let's now look at lexicons. Now, a lexicon is the central component of a natural language processing system, whether human or machine, and thus it is a central component of a theory of grammar. Why is this so? Well, any theory of grammar seeks to define, among others, the principles underlying language processing and language acquisition. Thus, the central word store in this respect is the mental lexicon rather than any variant of a dictionary. The reason is quite simple. Whereas dictionaries are static and do not allow any changes to their contents, the mental lexicon, the lexicon we have in our minds or the lexicon that is used in a grammatical theory, permits the possibility of changing its structure additions, extractions, rearrangement of the material or the modification of the entries. It closely interacts with other components of grammar and provides detailed information about the words to be generated. Let's see how this information, the information associated with lexical entries, is represented. And we will look at all levels of linguistics in the following from phonology to semantics. So let's start with phonology. Now here I have four lexemes, bill, C and that, and I would now like to build up the phonological information associated with each entry. The phonological specification in the lexicon defines the segmental and suprasegmental properties of a lexeme. That is, we have to present the phonemic structure, for example. So here, the fact that we have bill consisting of these phonemes. We could also represent allophonic information or distinctive feature information, but let's keep it as simple as possible. And we have to represent information about the syllable structure. So here, in this case, it is a typical syllable with an onset, a peak, and a coda. We might want to add stress aspects, intonational aspects. Well, here we don't have to do it because we have a monosyllabic entry in present-day English. Let's do the same for the other entries. Here we have C, which is a, this sort of syllable structure. And we have that which, well, that is an interesting element. It can be a weak form. So in connected speech, this behaves a little bit uh, different from the others. And finally, we have the preposition in, 
which has just a V C structure. So this then is the phonological representation of our four lexemes. Let's now look at the morphological information associated with our lexemes. Now, the morphological specification defines the lexical category, that is, the word class associated with each lexeme. Now, this would be very simple. However, we need a little bit more information than uh, that Bill is a noun. For example, we need a special noun class, let's call it noun class 2, which indicates to us, N2 would be an arbitrary symbol, by the way, which, indi which indicates to us that under normal circumstances, Bill does not involve a plural. Likewise, we have to represent that C is a verb, but again, we could use a symbol, let's call it V4. Again, that, this is fully arbitrary. We could call it V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, depending on our internal classification. Now here we want to indicate that uh, verbs of this particular type have an irregular past form which has to be retrieved um, else, from elsewhere. So, that is a determiner and in is a preposition. So, this is the morphological information. Let's now move on with syntax. The syntactic specification defines the context of a lexeme in terms of other categories. The notation is relatively straightforward. Now, first of all, we define the word class. Bill is a noun. And here we don't have to represent the fact that Bill is a special noun that uh, doesn't involve a plural under normal circumstances. We simply write down N for noun. Then a colon follows. This is a notational convention. And then we have the context in angular brackets. Now, what is the context of the noun? Well, this is the position of the noun itself. This is where the noun occurs. Can anything occur after the noun? Bill, my brother? Bill from London? Well, it can, almost unrestrictedly. However, before the noun, we have to represent the fact somehow that a determiner cannot be cannot precede so the bill is normally impossible well of course you can have sentences like the bill i know is much stronger than the bill you know but that's a special context let's now look at the verb c well c is a verb and well this would be the position of the verb, an underscore for the position. Well, and what can follow? Can I have a sentence like John sees, Mary saw? Well, I can't. What we do need is a noun phrase that follows. Well, and this frame, this representational format is called a subcategorization frame. Likewise, we can represent this information for that, which is our determiner. Well, what is the context of that? Well, that has to be followed by a noun that is represented in the singular. If we take this particular that as a determiner and not as a conjunction. Well, and finally, we have our preposition. Now, in English, prepositions, as the term says, precede something. Now, what do they precede? Well, they precede, obviously, a noun phrase. Well, and this noun phrase, well, it has to be locative or directional. So, in the garden in London and in five minutes, which is of course temporal, but time information can also be interpreted as a special case of location, locative information on a time scale. So this concludes the syntactic representation or the syntactic specification of a lexical entry. Let's now move on with the meaning, that is the semantic specification. 
Well, this specification defines the meaning of a lexeme. This can be done via lexical features in a binary fashion, plus minus values, or it can be done via special symbols that um, are coupled with more complex information. Well, let's do it uh, for our examples. Well, Bill, first of all, is of course our noun again, and now we can, of course, uh, associate some features with this. So, Bill is animate, Bill is human, Bill is male. Well, let's stop here. Now, for C, there are various options for a verb. One option defines um, a verb in terms of certain primitive acts. This would be the conceptual dependency theory, which goes back to the American psychologist Roger Shank. An alternative representation would use thematic roles in order to define what sort of noun phrases can surface as a subject, as the object of a particular verb. So this means it's a verb of mental transfer, which involves then certain um, roles and um, objects and classes to be associated with it. Well, that is our determiner. It is um, demonstrative. Well, we could say it's definite as well. Well, and our preposition, well, we've seen that already, is locative and directional. So these are the semantic features associated with our preposition. Let's summarize and take our entry bill. Well, here you see the collection of lexical specifications that are associated with our lexeme bill. Lexemes, by the way, I forgot to mention, are always presented in capital letters. This is a convention in linguistics. Now here we have the phonology. This would be the morphology. Syntactic representation. And finally, we have the sort of, well, semantics or meaning representation associated with our lexical entry. In the theory of grammar, linguists are primarily concerned with those aspects that are necessary to define the legitimacy of syntactic structures. That is, they confine themselves, by and large, to the morphological and syntactic aspects where a little bit of the semantics enters into the syntactic representation because we have to specify the arguments of verbs and of other categories in terms of thematic information. But that's a different story which will be explained in the e-lecture lexical insertion.